and you can agree or disagree. It's being done in secret. They could buy these things. All they have to do to buy these things on the open market is to sign the additional protocol with the IAEA, and the Russians would sell them a reactor tomorrow. But it's a poor program. From the things that we've seen, from those photographs I showed you, there's poor workmanship. It's a top-down management system. You will do this, not how should you do this. They're telling people what to do, and I find, in my life experience, people don't behave very well in that situation. It's certainly only a few years along because the equipment I'm showing you is small. It's prototype. It's not the kind of thing you do for a large production system, but they're starting along. And if we look at purchases of equipment and satellite imagery, we can see that most of the things that we know about have only really been serious in about the last five years. So this is not a well-developed program. It's not, I don't think it's going very well. It is, however, a violation of agreements. It's a violation of everything with the IAEA, and it's a violation of their obligations to ASEAN nuclear weapons free zone. It's a violation. Okay? It's against the law. They shouldn't be doing this. And, and I'm sorry, I've been doing what I've been doing for long enough that I like to catch somebody early and make them stop. I don't think the people of Bangkok need to worry about a nuclear bomb tomorrow, the next day, or the next week. I will speak a little more about that. But this program, as we see it today, is just not a threat in terms of a, of a nuclear mushroom cloud. It is a threat to the whole system as the problem. And I don't think ignoring it should be an option. One of the things that we wanted to come out of our process and, and going public with this is I've worked with people for a long time who, when they get the information, classify it very highly and don't tell anybody, and then nobody has to do anything. Uh, well, in this case, we have put enough information out there that somebody needs to do something, or I think we can say that they're deficient. Uh, one of the good things that happened is within a few days of our publication back in June, uh, someone got to DVB in, in, um, in Oslo, someone who was inside Burma, and corrected the mistake. We had a, a photograph labeled wrong. And the person came back and said, we really approve of what you're doing. We think this is wonderful that you're exposing this program. You need to get this right. Uh, we actually had mixed up uh, DSA with DSTA in Puno Nguyen. And, and we changed our briefing. Uh, ProPublica in the United States has provided us with two source debriefings of sources who give the same information in less detail, but they talk about their training in Moscow, the people they were with, and things like that. So we're starting to see more source debriefings come in, and they complement when. Again, when is the Rosetta Stone? He doesn't know the answers to these things. He's just given us a lot of context. And I've already mentioned Dictator Watch. Some of the stuff that Roland has put out over the last uh, four months is good as gold. There's really some good stuff in there, and we need to be paying attention to what he's doing. I'm doing everything I can to maintain a good relationship with him, and also with Desmond Ball. What can we do that could help? The IAEA needs help. They don't have an army. They don't have, they don't have guns. They, can, they did what we expected they would do after our, our June report. They sent a letter to Burma and said, are you doing this? Is this true? And Burma said, no. That's it. When, when IAEA picks up the phone and calls Burma, if it's about technical cooperation, we want to give you money for training, they answer the phone, they invite people to come. They're very happy to do it. If IAEA calls up and says, you have some out-of-date safeguards agreements, click. They don't say yes, they don't say no, they just don't answer. And, and then they have the, the affrontery to come to the general conference of the IAEA, and when they give their speech to the general conference, uh, they mention that they think the additional protocol is a really good idea. They don't mention why they don't sign it. A hundred countries that have nothing to hide have signed the additional protocol. I know that's circumstantial, but you know, if you have nothing to hide, what's the problem? And I'm not sure I define the small quantities protocol, but that's the one where Burma has said to the IAEA and the IAEA accept, accepted it, we have no nuclear facilities, we have no nuclear materials, you don't need to come. That was signed back in 1995. And after that was signed, the IAEA can't come. So I, all most they can do is send a letter saying, is this true? No. According to the press, IAEA has now sent three letters, and the answer every time has been no, and that somebody you can hear right now is a dirty, rotten liar. So. Um, that's, that's their opinion. So I would say the first thing you do is people who don't answer the phone and don't cooperate with you, you don't send them money. Well, the bleeding hearts right away say, but some of this is being used for humanitarian purposes in medical terms. I say, so what? 1.3 million from the IAEA being cut off, let's give them zero, is, is the first way you send a message that 
we're going to take this seriously. I can assure you there are two sides to the IAEA. One of them is saying, right on, Bob, it's about time somebody said this. And the other side is saying, you can't do that. It's against our, our, um, our statute. Suppliers groups need to get involved. We certainly need to make sure nuclear suppliers group, MTCR, people like that are fully aware of what we found and, and what we're doing. And pressure from ASEAN. Now, I, I said at the beginning I'm a technical person and my two panelists will take any questions on this topic. But <laughs> I just have a couple more slides. And where do we go from here? Well, I, I like this Irrawaddy article. Thank you. That was a very nice title. The title was Sancho is Angry About the Kelly Report. Uh, <laughs> that made my day. Now, I'm not sure that Irrawaddy is exactly, yes, I, I'm not sure how believable you are, whether you had somebody in the office when he got mad. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you did. I hope you didn't make up this title. <laughs> but I loved it. I sent it to everybody I know. Uh, he's unhappy because I've assessed the program as being no good. And he's been told it's a great program. <laughs> I'm saying it's unlikely to succeed. And I know that Coco U has a new job now. So <laughs> those are good things about it. And we need to put pressure on for this at IAE additional protocol. They don't answer the phone, we don't help them, and we start to squeeze them. I'm not a big believer in sanctions, but this is a moment for a little bit of pressure. We need to enforce the non-proliferation treaty, and we really need more information. And so any defector who shows up, we want to know what he knows. And sometimes it's just rumors. But now the rumors are starting to mean more because now we have the rumors in context. In trying to think of what Burma could do, this is almost a cry to them. And I'm saying, think about what happened to Libya. You know, Libya back in, in 2003 was sitting there on top of a centrifuge program and a nuclear program that had no chance of success, just like the one in Burma at the moment. And, and they decided, hey, everybody knows about this. They were cheating on AQCon. They were going to turn him in. And AQCon was cheating on them and making things more expensive. And, and they thought about this, and they said, hey, well, you know, let's just let's give it up. And I think it was really the UK that gets credit for opening the door. But between the UK and the US, they jawboned them into giving up the program. And they had to do it in a verifiable way. They had to disclose the activities. They had to say where they got their materials and things, and they had to allow inspections. And I did a lot of inspections in Libya uh, where we convinced ourselves that we knew the state of the weapons program, and I would be very ready to go to Burma and do the same. They got diplomatic representation in the process. They got sanctions removed. I don't think it applies to Burma, but they were removed from the sponsors of international terrorism. I think that's a much better solution for Burma than it is to run a poorly developed, uh, poorly run, poorly conceived program that has very little chance of success. In closing, I, I would say this. I, I'm a little worried about underplaying their program, and that was, I think I tried to say that in the nation this morning. There are two ways that this program could suddenly turn into a real threat. Okay? Everything I've seen from internal information, they're not doing very well in my opinion. But if another country steps in and has all of the knowledge, materials, and maybe the key to some of the things that are plaguing them, including bad management, this program could really speed up. If you look at the Iraqi program, it went on for about 10 years, just going like this because it was run by a bunch of scientists. And in 1989, along came Hussein Kamel, and, and Saddam Hussein said to him, fix it. Well, Hussein Kamel fixed things with a gun to people's head, and he was a military guy. And he said, we're restructuring this program. We're going to have some goals and milestones. And the program went like that. And it's a damn good thing that in 1990 we cut it off because a program that wasn't going anywhere because of a bunch of scientists like me, uh, they didn't understand what they were trying to do. And Hussein Kamel put them on a totally different track. Everything I've said about being a poor program goes out the door if that happens. And DPRK is certainly the country I have in mind. Secondly, I've only seen a small piece of the program. My source knows this narrow slice that he saw. He worked in these two factories making these things. If there's more outside the program, I don't know yet. I don't know what's going on in other areas. And I'm just, I, I think it's safe to say the people of Thailand are safe for the next few years because these guys don't know what they're doing. I wouldn't want to give them more than a few more years. But if they don't get outside help, I don't think they'll ever succeed. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'm a technical guy. My colleagues will take the next few minutes, and then if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Zani will offer a Burmese, uh, you know, give us background on the Burmese military's thinking behind it and also put it in that perspective. Go ahead. Um, shall we swamp? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, the last time I, I heard a scientific or tech, very technical um, uh, discussion was back in 1984. That was the last time I was in uh, university in Mandalay. And um, I studied um, a major in chemistry and um, minor in physics. And I had a couple courses in quantum physics. And I basically th tried to do three things um, in the past. One was run away from science, so switch to something that is, you know, better, more fun, and uh, I can live with within my own world of opinions, which is called social sciences. And so I'm a, you know, in quote social scientist. Um, but now, like you know, um, having to l sit through this, you know, uh, evening listening to uh, to Bob, and I left the country. Um, let me start with a, a very brief personal note, uh, because you know Burma is a personal issue, not just an academic or research issue for me. Um, I left the country before the uprisings in 1988, and I was determined that I, I would not return to that country. I would never live under military rule, and still don't live there. Um, but I, I, I have. Um, come to embrace the fact that this is my country, I need to deal with the, the issues of military. And then I landed in um, California into a family uh, that sponsored me, an uh, American family. Um, the son works in the uh, Lawrence Livermore lab as the uh, uh, nuclear um, you know, uh, radiation um, 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 biochemist. And the, uh, the old lady there, who was the matria, she was a secretary for Enrico uh, Fermi, who was part of the Manhattan Project. And so they tried to convince me to go into science, and I, draw, I drew the line. No, no, no science. So, so it's, it's, you know, how um, fate um, takes you to places. And uh, these are issues that I did not, and I don't want to deal with, but this, these are pressing issues. The first time the, um, the, the issue of um, Burmese nuclear program, or the ambition, came to my attention. That's, that was in uh, 2004, six years ago. Not from uh, intelligence sources, or not from activists, but from a business person who was very close to the Burmese intelligence. And um, the person told me, you know, they were going for the nukes. Yeah? I was like, well, um, well, maybe you may have some eggs to grind against you know, the generals that you rub shoulders with because you, know, you lost businesses, or they, took, you know, they, want you, they wanted you to buy Mercedes and this and that. And I, I, I thought like she was, polit uh, she was politically motivated. It was a she. Um, then what was interesting was, you know, then a couple other um, friends of mine who were based in Chiang Mai or Mesa, uh, one person specifically phoned me when I was living in the USA. Look, you know, one guy came over to Thailand and contacted him because he was a well-known activist and said, look, you know, I've got uranium. You know, I used to work in, the, uh, I was working in the mine, I fled. That was 2005, yeah. And then you talk to the people in Washington and other places, uh, they basically poo-poo the ideas. Okay, you wanted to overthrow this government, here's the perfect issue because human rights is not getting you anywhere. So this is, you know, exiles and dissidents, and okay, are they all uh, uh, politically motivated? Um, that is the general perception. And so I'm, I'm going to address that issue here because I myself did not believe that, you know, uh, this could be a factual um, uh, story. You know, I thought they were politically motivated.